With coaching, you help unlock people, you help unlock their potential. And so that's something that I think is really valuable, especially now where, you know, the market's uncertain, AI is disrupting things. There's just so much unknowns beyond what, you know, we typically face in the technology sector through coaching, through other means. I think it's really important to understand why you want to do what you want to do. Mm. And that then becomes, you know, your North Star. The Wise Ones is a community-driven podcast which has leading operators, subject matter experts, founders and VCs interview each other to reveal insights into how they built and scaled their products, businesses, software, and how they brought their ideas to life. Diana Stepner is a seasoned product leader with over 20 years of experience leading product teams across the globe. She has worked with companies like Monster, Razorfish, and Simple Practice, and is now focused on leadership coaching. And I have with me Diana Stepner. Diana, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, so exactly, I'm Diana Stepner. So my background's in product management. I've led product teams for over 20 years around the globe. And earlier this year, I decided to focus on coaching full-time, so leadership coaching, because I love launching people even more than I love launching products. And I love launching products an amazing amount. So that could tell you something. That's absolutely brilliant, brilliant. All right, I'm your host. We'll be doing a bit of a switcheroo. The next time around, I'm Arvinda Gujral. Um, I'm probably called the go-to market guy. Uh, I, I live and work out of Singapore, uh, have lived in the US, India, and now Singapore home for the last seven years. So excited to host uh, Diana on our first Wise Talks. now. Wisely is a platform that enables knowledge sharing between experts and those who are seeking uh, solutions to problem statements, uh, like go-to-market, product management, hiring, uh, culture fit, et cetera, et cetera. So go check out Wisely. Uh, you, I'm sure you'll get your words out there. Uh, let's get into it, uh, Diana. So you've had a long, interesting career. Um, you've gone from corporate jobs, very standard, normal corporate jobs, VP of product and X and Y, uh, to now doing a lot more on coaching. So let's start from the early years. Who who is Diana Stepney? Like, how would you describe yourself? So I've always been interested in people, and so I think that's the common thread throughout my whole journey. I am an only child, and so I think from that perspective, I've always been you know observing the world around me. And so when I went to university, I got a degree in communications because I wanted to be able to, you know, bring people together, you know, produce a TV show or a radio program or something like that to be able to bring information to people. And then I realized with communications, you could do everything and nothing. Mm. And so I, I went to business school right after university and I loved it. It was like a whole bunch of people doing brainstorming and case studies and just, you know, getting together and just really exchanging knowledge. And I love that. And I was sitting in a class and someone, you know, we were talking about, you know, what do you want to do over the summer? You know, it was like our graduating for the first year. What do you want to do in the summer before you come back? And I said, well, I'd like to work at a company that combines communication and technology mm. and someone behind me said, I work at a company that does exactly that. So they worked at a CRM company called Epsilon. And I just tracked Epsilon, you know, through graduation and worked at Epsilon. And it it's where I combined my technology. And I grew up in Silicon Valley. I'm from Cupertino. So I knew tech that was just in my blood, combined the pieces of, you know, the whole fascination with people and communication and brought that together with the business that I had been learning through my business program. And I loved doing it. I did customer analysis. I did segmentation. I did, you know, marketing campaigns, direct mail campaigns at that time, everything. And I loved it. I was able to mm. learn so much more about people, about the companies. And so the first, you know, I guess segment of my career was in CRM. Wisely is an AI-powered knowledge platform that helps experts organize, scale, and monetize their knowledge. How did that inform you as a person? Like, you know, I mean, getting, you know, the thing is, 
people usually always are the binding force of an organization. Uh, you know, you, you usually start, it's always a person who has an idea and an ambition about transforming whatever they are looking at doing, right? Could be just transforming something as some mundane as I want to make the best email product out there. Like something as simple as that to I want to change people's lives and connect them together on a social platform. But at the end of the day, it is usually a person who comes up with a brilliant or a set of people, group of people who come up with some ambition and some ambitious idea and say, we want to do this. And as the organization gets larger, that ambition breaks down and you have dilution of thought leadership inside the organization about what they really started to do and what they ended up doing. And then you create silos and then you have politics and you have all the stuff. So let, let's go at the beginning. You got, you did your school, B school. I mean, you did your graduation. What was your first break? And if you can, link it to your first breakdown where things went absolutely south for you. And I'll tell you why I'm connecting the two dots here. Yeah, so when, I may reverse it if that's okay. Like when I graduated from, when I graduated from business school, I didn't have any work experience because I had Mm -hmm. gone straight from university to graduate school. And so when I was applying for jobs, people didn't know what to do with me. They were like, you've got all this schooling, but you have no experience. I mean, I'd work summer jobs and all of that. I dealt with writing during university, but I didn't have like a real full-time job. So they didn't know what to do with me. I was like overqualified and underqualified at the same time. And so I, I did, you know, random jobs in technology for a couple of years before, you know, I, I did get a role at Epsilon. And I think the thing, and I, you know, I think quote the break is that I've always had grit. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I don't give up. I just, you know, I, I see something, I want it, and I do the hard work to get it. I'm not saying that's easy. I'm not saying that I didn't you know, have breakdowns along the way. <laughs> totally did. But I knew what I wanted to do, and it took, you know, all of my motivation, all my commitment, all my, you know, integrity just to see that through. And so the first break was essentially getting that first real job and mm-hmm. then using that as a stepping stone to the next one and to the next one. And eventually, you know, that led to where I wanted to be. Mm. And how do you connect that to your your current trajectory of life where you're more into coaching and helping people discover their truer self, even though it's in product management, et cetera. And is, does that inform you at all? Or there's just two parallel parts that don't collide? Yeah, it it totally informs my coaching. And I think it's because a lot of us, myself included, have felt stuck. Yeah. And with coaching, you help unlock people. You help unlock their potential. And so that's something that I think is really valuable, especially now where, you know, the market's uncertain, AI is disrupting things. There's just so much unknowns beyond what, you know, we typically face in the technology sector that people are really feeling confused and frustrated and ignored and just don't know how to navigate. But I think deep down, they have the the faith, the will to be able to keep striving, but they benefit from someone helping them unlock that untapped potential that's inside of them. And so for me, you know, that's what I did. And I'd love to be able to help people realize that in themselves. Let me tie the two thoughts together again. So on one hand, you've had a very interesting and amazing career in product management, right? Uh, You're also stepping into coaching people into being a better person uh, at work, could be in product management or outside. If I take the parallel that a person is also a product of their circumstances, and so you could be your own product manager of who you are, right? And you cannot be a product, you can also be a product manager at work building products and services that you really like to build for the startup or the company you're working at. How does one inform the other? Um, And where I'm coming from is, you, you had early struggles like everyone else in their career, in their life. They've had personal issues and issues at work. You feel stuck, right? A startup is not growing, right? So, you know, you have a lot of parallels. You as an individual are not growing. Your startup is stuck at 1 million ARR. That's not growing. You as an individual are, you know, the same person few years ago. You have not learned any upskill or renewed your skill set. And so you feel a little outdated. You have the syndrome that I'm not good enough. 
you know, startup product is not evolving, the product manager and or the founders are not doing a good job, and they feel that the comp the competitors landscape has completely changed, and you are still stuck on the old feature set. Your roadmap is not is just getting longer, and nothing is getting deployed. You know, it's just so many parallels between the product manager and the manager itself, and the person behind the, being a product manager. So if you were to be talking to a, a a new product manager at a startup right now, how would what would you tell them uh, to ex what should they expect getting into this role, <laughs> uh, and what should they expect getting out of the role? Yeah, I think I guess I always take things a step earlier. Like I like to understand what is it that led people to think product management was where they wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And so it goes back to understanding your true drive, your true ambition. I think there was times where people thought product management was where to go if you wanted to be the mini CEO, because that would get you the path to being the CEO, but they didn't really want to be product managers. They wanted to be something else and they just saw that as a path. And so, you know, through, through coaching, through other means, I think it's really important to understand why you want to do what you want to do. Mm. And that then becomes, you know, your North star. If it's to improve people's outcomes or to make people's lives better. And you have a combination of, you know, you want to be curious. You want to be able to work cross-functionally. You want to be able to navigate, you know, difficult situations with stakeholders. If you have all of these different facets that you want to bring together to bring a product, something to life, then product management would probably be brilliant for you. Mm -hmm. But if you have, you know, a different type of lens and you're just doing it as a stepping stone to something else, it's difficult to say if all of your conviction would be mm. in the role or you'd be continuing to look at the next thing. Uh, absolutely. I couldn't agree more with you there, Diana. Uh, and if you just take product management as a skill set today, how is it evolving? Like where do you see this 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 role evolving within the organization, especially and you know, a lot of the audience that we are hopefully listening to this podcast are probably working at a startup or founding their own startups, right? Or people who are working in large organizations thinking like a startup inside the large uh, organization. Like I want to create that velocity that a startup really does inside my large, large org. How, how should they think about product management as a role and how is it evolving in your, in your perspective, given, you know, AI and so many companion tools that we all use. So things that you used to do as a product manager that you don't no longer need to do because you can have AI help you get you, you know, be more efficient at your work versus the just the change and the transformation of the role itself. Yeah. I think there's there's a lot of perceptions and I'm I'm obviously coming at it from a product management lens. One of the things that we're seeing is mergers of roles. So mm -hmm. some people who were product managers who are also good at design are starting to you know become kind of hybrid engineers who also were, you know, being involved in product are starting to merge some of those aspects. So I do think just because of, you know, AI and some of the capabilities that it provides, we may see some merging of roles. Mm -hmm. All of the things that a product person does are still critical. It's that communication, that connection, that curiosity, that discovery, that interaction with humans is still necessary. And it's not something that AI can do today. Humans are tricky. We don't do what we say we're going to do. <laughs> we don't mean what we say. <laughs> and those things are really critical to a product person to be able to suss out, to figure out what's the real need that is driving that person. Mm. And you're not going to get that by asking a chatbot. Oh, that's, I think we mean what we say and we say what we mean as usually <laughs> so two different things. Right. And I think, okay, um, we can tell you on this podcast, we are saying everything what we mean and we mean what we say. So <laughs> there, there you go. You're um, actual people. <laughs> <laughs> How, give me an instance. I would love, I would love to uh, hear some example of what you, you know, go back in your timeline uh, of your LinkedIn profile and say, you know what, you worked at Kayak, Razorfish, Monster, Salesforce, uh, the, you know, the Giant Zuckerberg Initiative, Pearson, where you spent over a decade uh, working there. Like, just take any one of those examples and where you, 
what you thought and you know the, the the difference in what you thought you would be delivering as a product manager a vp of product versus what you ended up doing and where you saw the transformation of the role so that it just becomes a little more for those who are listening they can actually visualize the 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 change yeah it so i yeah again i've been a product manager for a very long time and so when i started out people may laugh but you know these functional requirement documents were the bible that was what mm. you followed i mean you would check things off as you built them that was the beginning and i'll be honest that was really terrible uh, <laughs> Because everything would change. As soon as you did something, it caused a chain of events, but you couldn't do those chains of events unless you went back and changed this monolithic document. And I was so glad when, you know, we started to advocate for, you know, more conversations between product and engineering and design instead of handing over a document and saying, you know, luck be with you. (laughs) And... And so that to me was one of the biggest shifts. It's like breaking down the walls, having those conversations, being able to do things more iteratively and being able to apply learnings really quickly as opposed to, you know, that waterfall after everything was done. And so I, you know, I worked at one startup where, you know, the the, the documentation was, you know, what you did. And that was the last time I ever did that because we couldn't build things in an agile way. Mm. And that just from my customer experience background, the CRM background, I knew that wasn't right because you were always fine tuning campaigns to reach those customers, you know, and their mind is shifting towards what's, you know, being discussed in the news. You needed to incorporate that. There was always evolution. So applying that to product meant these documents that did not change, they were just going to have to go by the wayside. I'm just going to take another gem of thought and connect it to what you just said. Yeah. Because talking to people on a daily basis cross-functionally is so critical because the role evolves, the things change, and you have so many second and third order impact of one change you do in the product that which are unintended or unseen till you do it and you can't predict them. And once that happens, you have to react to that and then you make another change and that has two or three levels of other consequential changes that you haven't predicted. When I'm connecting this to is you work from home, remote work. When you have people, distributed product teams, distributed engineering teams working remotely in different time zones, you're not even working at the same time. How do you manage this chaos? Because, and I say chaos only because you want to react in real time. You're not in the same office or location. You're not even in the same time zone that you can communicate effectively with the, with the team forget your team with the cross-functional team because product does not work in isolation they have to talk to engineering and design how in today's world of remote first so many remote first startups out there how do you think they should be managing this chaos this unintended chaos that one action has uh as a butterfly effect across the product suite right and i think when we step back we realized that a lot of our roles before remote and hybrid were a thing mm-hmm. were actually hybrid. And what I mean is, you know, I worked at Monster and I worked in Monster in the UK. I was mm-hmm. responsible for UK and Ireland. Ireland is a different place. So I had people that were not in my office. We worked with Monster's headquarters, which was outside of Boston. So we were hybrid. We didn't call it that but we were. And so at least from the way that my career has developed, I've always been working across time zones. I've always worked across continents. I've always worked across offices. And that is just something that made the experiences better Mm -hmm. because the U S monster, for example, would have a certain way of searching or requirements. Germany or France or Spain would have different requirements. And so by having the ability to work with people in different geographies, we got a product that was much more relevant Mm. and usable and intuitive as opposed to the people in the US just cutting and pasting it everywhere. So I think that hybrid, that remote mindset 
opens up opportunities to do things that resonate with people more than if you just all sat in the same place. So uh, and I, I love yeah. the diversity. In, in fact, it just uh, struck me that I actually have worked in an organization in the year 2000 that yeah. did this at scale globally. And I'll give an example and I'm like, oh, how, why didn't I think of this before? So the company was called Infosys. It's a very, very large IT consulting and services organization about I don't know, 200, 300,000 people now, multiple billion dollars in revenue. Uh, it's just a giant behemoth. And if you think about it, in the year 2000, or even before, when uh, before I joined Infosys, and it's been there since the early 90s or late 80s, their whole business model was, you give me a piece of your IT work, I'll have people in Bangalore deliver it for you while you're sleeping in, in San Francisco. So not only were they not in the same office, they were not in the same time zone. And in fact, being in a different time zone was a time arbitrage that they used apart from the cost arbitrage, but it was a time arbitrage that we will continue doing the work for you when you're asleep. And when you wake up, you will have that work delivered to you. And my team, which is sitting in location with you in your office, will take that work forward so you'd have a 12 hour window where you are working 12 hour window when you're sleeping we are working and you just keep hand holding uh the piece of work and i'm like how do you orchestrate and they've perfected the orchestration of this since the late 80s and you know you have tcs emphasis with so many large global it services company then you know the uh the accenture of the world like realized that hey, hey i can make more money higher margins uh, and do a twice the work for my client and hence build twice uh for my clients globally and now you have accentures and of the world who have tens of thousands of people employed in various offshore locations around the world doing exactly the same thing so while we feel very proud as you know <laughs> Post COVID, we are living in a remote work. I'm like, people, this has been perfected for two for a couple of decades before we woke up yeah. to the reality of remote work. Totally, and I mean, I worked at Razorfish, which is a digital agency. My clients were all over the place, and yeah, sometimes we got to fly to them, but that mm -hmm. was rare. And so I think it's just the terms may not have been as significant at that point of time. And so we we kind of forget that this way of working, as you described, has been with us you know, for, for an extensive amount of time. Awesome. Now, just a serendipity, and this is the value of having a conversation as open-ended as we are having, because, you know, two, two different germs of thoughts collide and you have a serendipitous aha moment, like, oh, dude, I actually work for a company that did this model. Yeah. Anyways, I want to bring it back uh, down to a level from, you know, um, macro to very specific. Uh, a lot of the people who are listening in are, are startup founders and working at startups and or smaller organizations. And, you know, usually tech startups, I think, uh, are the ones listening in. And you have all these functions in, in, in a startup from, you know, sales and marketing and product and engineering and, uh, you know, and HR and you have a founder's office. Where does the product management, uh, the PM sit in the middle, right? Uh, and let me let me just paint a scenario for the rest of the conversation. Let's say you're a pre-Series A, you're a, a million ARR uh, revenue company. Uh, you have about 30, 40 people in it. Uh, one per a percentage which is in product, a percentage in dev engineering, a percentage in GTM, etc. Uh, and you're still pivoting, right? You have early wins. You have got product market fit. You've got some customers who are paying you consistently for a year. You have low churn. Uh, you have a, a repeatable sales motion, which is moving away from a founder-led sales motion to now uh, a VP of sales or a head of sales with a small team that is able to take the product. Um, could be a PLG or could be a sales-led business. It doesn't matter. And But you see... The, Nobody is living in a in an ideal world. There is no competition. That doesn't exist. That nirvana, unfortunately, doesn't exist. So you have hyper competition in your in whichever space you're working in, or very lots of close substitutes to the solution that you're developing. In this environment, where everything gets challenged, from product parity, feature parity, your customers say, "Huh, I can do this myself," or you have ten other customers, uh, competitors who are giving better or more features, or your pricing is under pressure. Uh, you have hyper competition. So, you know, you are always sitting in the reception with five other people from a different competitor. Uh, you have engineering and PMs and salespeople leaving to go to another larger company or another startup, which is hungrier and getting higher traction. 
and then the founder is sitting there scratching their heads like okay what should i look at first should i look at product should i look at pricing should i look at sales should i look at pmf like where does like if you're a vp of product uh, and you work very closely with the founder what is your role and where does it sit inside this mess and chaos of a startup so i think you're describing life um <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's like these inflection points i think um a lot of companies are founded by people who had a problem and i'll give an example i worked at simple practice the, the person who founded Simple Practice was a mental health and wellness practitioner. He spent a lot of his time trying to, you know, track clients, schedule, you know, therapy sessions. Just uh, for the audience sake, what does Simple Practice do? Just Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm describing. So, ah, okay. um, all right. Yyeah, so it was he was spending a lot of time, you know, trying to manage all parts of his business. And he was a mental health and wellness therapist, so he had to schedule meetings with his clients. He had to do the billing. He had to do the reports. He had to do the documentation. So he created and built Simple Practice, which is an end-to-end -end application, cloud application, that allows a therapist to manage all aspects of their business simply and easily. So he allowed them to spend time with their clients as opposed to trying to duct tape, super glue together all of these different capabilities. And as a founder and as a founder who had experienced a problem, he had a lot of amazing ideas about what to build and how to build mm -hmm. it and when to build it. And I think that's quite common at the stage of company that you're describing, that the founder experienced a problem or saw an opportunity, has direct examples or direct um, experience with that, and often is the first product person. And so when you bring in someone else to do product at that stage, the notion is you're doing a lot of what the CEO wants to do. And so you're more of a, a feature PM, I would say, mm, at that point, mm. because you are leveraging and building upon the insight that the CEO has. Mm -hmm. As the company grows, as you said, there becomes a point where the CEO can't wear, you know, all these different hats. They really need to be a CEO. And that's when you start to see product become more, I'm going to say empowered to use the Marty Kagan term and starting to be more strategic around the vision, the direction, the opportunities, the competitors, the marketplace. And that's, you know, it varies based on company to company at what point that happens at simple practice, it was around, it was very funny. It was like a 10 year old startup. So it was about 10 years when the pandemic hit and everybody could do telehealth and just mental health and wellness just boomed. And so that was the trigger where it really needed to shift. So there'll be these afflictions that'll cause the company to need to reprioritize, have the CEO be the CEO and have product be able to step up and do more strategic thinking than they did previously. Interesting, interesting. And just taking that forward, you know, I, I sit on the board of a few startups and I invested in multiple. And I always wonder the genesis, right, of the, like, the, everything starts with somebody having an idea. And my question would be, would the idea stem from, I want to build a product? Or would the idea come from, this is the customer I want to serve? So what comes first, a product or the customer? So you're talking to a product person. So. Yeah. Ah, I should have realized part, this is a self-serving question. <laughs> but I do believe you need to identify a problem to solve. Mm -hmm. If you're just saying, I want to solve, you know, something for, you know, people who are, you know, I don't know what your specific need would be, you're, mm -hmm. you don't really have a focus. You don't have a direction. You don't have a rallying cry. And so I think it becomes very difficult to obtain traction until mm. you've identified that ideal customer persona or that ideal customer per persona, yeah, profile, however you want to decide yeah, what yeah. it stands for. But I think you need to identify that person before you really hone in on the, the product. The mm. person will inform the product, the product will inform the person, but you need to have that person in mind to be able to essentially build something with them as your, your target. Mm. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I sometimes write and I, and I, and I read about people who write and 
there are two schools of thought. Yeah. If you're writing, in fact, uh, somebody once said, I don't know who it was. If you're writing for everybody, you're writing for nobody. Uh, and I think if you're building for everybody, a product, you're building for nobody. And I think that's so true about, you know, having a defined ICP or I ideal customer profile or persona so that you're building for that one person in mind, because once you do that, there are probably millions of the same people, person that you had in mind who will want to identify with the same problem statement that you identified as a unique insight, given your context of where you're coming from. Totally. But, the, it. but what, does, what does ICP mean then? And like, I can, I get it in a, in a very high level way, you know, this is my ICP, but if you could just help us understand and help the audience understand through an example that you, you know, you worked on so many products uh, across over two decades, how would you, you know, kind of narrow it down to a version that stays true? And because what I have seen, the reason I'm asking this, I have seen the definition of ICP bloat so much that it is no longer an ideal per, uh, customer profile, it ideal customer's profile. And you are just mixing up so many different segments that everybody is your customer. <laughs> and as I said, if you're writing for everybody, you're writing for nobody. If you're building for everybody, you're not building for nobody. So what is a true ICP? Yeah, so you know the, the definition is you wanna be able to envision a specific person. And mm. oftentimes you will see it depicted as a person. So you'll have a persona that you're building towards. That persona will have specific values. They'll have specific needs. They'll have, you know, maybe some demographic characteristics, but I feel they're not as important as, you know, what drives those individuals. So it's almost those, those intrinsic things that are really motivating the person to take an mm -hmm. action. And so it's creating, an ICP is creating a picture of a person and those characteristics, those needs, those values, you can say willingness to pay that make them who they are and drive them to you know, seek out a specific solution or to buy a specific product. So that's what you're looking for. There's, you know, obviously longer definitions we can give, but I think we're definitely moving away more from demographic segmentation mm -hmm. to more, you know, again, that persona segmentation that is more characterized by, I'm going to say human elements than you happen to be 23. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, I'm just going to connect another, again, that's why I love these kind of conversations. I, I, I've worked in marketing before. And then when you do marketing, you create that persona of the marketing, uh, marketing persona. So who are you targeting, right? And it is so, uh, actually, I would love, you know, if you're, if you're a startup and you have two teams, a product team and a marketing team, both ideally would have an ideal customer profile and an ideal marketing persona. Just see if they match. A chance that they won't match. Ideally, they should match because you want to talk to the same, you're building for this person, you should be talking to the same person. Yeah. But usually I see a massive gap between who you're building for and who you're targeting in your campaigns. And I think that that is where, you know, the, the dilution of your messaging and the product happens and your GTM fails. So instead of blaming that poor AE who's out in the field knocking every door because he or she does not know which door to knock because yeah. it's such a diluted messaging and the persona is uh, very different. I mean, it's it's like, as I said, by the time the AE gets the brief, he or she is calling anyone they think is remotely connected to the problem statement. Sure. Uh, and I think that's where the mismatch happens in most startups, right? And I think uh, being true to who you are building for as long as you can, because there will be dilution uh, along the way, but as long as you can, I think will help you, you know, create that uh, foundational layer of uh, uh, sustainable business. Yeah. And I think you're hitting a great point that people don't stay the same. Hmm. And so how do you evolve or do you evolve as your customer evolves? Hmm. So you may have targeted people, you know, with a specific lifestyle product, but their lives are going to change. They're going to have kids. They're going to buy a home. So do you evolve with them or do you, you know, thank them very much and send them on their way? So there's a lot of interesting decisions to be made about that ideal customer. And just taking that forward, as the customer evolves, as your product evolves, and when, when we say a product evolves, you're adding more things, bells and whistles and feature sets to your product. 
and as and you know as a as a GDM person, and whenever I talk to my head of product, I'm like your 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 roadmap is longer than my revenue pipeline. <laughs> so what is real in your in your roadmap, right? And how do you prioritize? Like uh, what is critical versus what is important versus what's good to have? Yeah, and I will say every company will have their own approach. I mean, the one that comes to mind for me is being simple and straightforward is the Eisenhower matrix. You think about what can you build quickly with mm -hmm. the least amount of effort. So you're looking at impact versus effort. And that's a really rough rubric to be able to determine what you want to prioritize. I've also seen a lot of people use Bryce. And so you're looking at you know the business, you're looking at the risk, you're looking at the impact. So companies will typically do some modeling to that effect to be mm -hmm. able to determine at a high level, where can you move fastest and have the most velocity, the most traction. Mm -hmm. And that's a good balancing act. But you also need to think about times where you've got to invest now to benefit in a couple years. And that sounds almost fictional, but when you're looking at the underlying technology, for example, if you don't you do some care and feeding consistently, eventually mm. your platform's gonna be out of date. So mm. there are things that you've got to tweak along the way that may not be you know, an amazing impact, but they allow you to kick in and have impact at a future time. Now, one of the things that I've always wondered is when you do product, you do product packaging, which means product pricing, right? And there are so many pricing models. Like I, I work in the SaaS industry right now, and you know there's usages pricing, there is steer based pricing, there is just so many different pricing models. There is a hybrid pricing, uh, there's a licensing fee. Some have one time setup fees, some have annual maintenance contracts. So there is uh, it just you have expansion revenue, you have churn to take care of. So when you are a PM in a startup, how? Obviously, the pricing will determine is determined largely by the industry you're servicing and and the sector of the customer you're servicing. But who decides pricing <laughs> in the organization? Who, who is responsible for the pricing and whether a the model of pricing and two should we increase or decrease the pricing? Like who is the person responsible for that? Um, one of the things from product is the answer is often it depends. <laughs> <laughs> And so it, it does depend. Um, in some companies, you'll have a pricing person and they mm. will be part of the go-to-market team or the product marketing team. Other companies, you will have product marketing that does the pricing. At other companies, product will do the pricing. So it, it really does depend. I don't think there's one, one, it must be this way. You need to think about it within you know the construct of your organization, the stage you're at, the scale, your market, et cetera. But I always think of pricing as being a little bit art and a little bit science. And it's exactly for the reasons you said, you've got to make sure that people feel, see, experience the value based on what they're paying. Mm, so mm. if they think the value is less than what you're charging, you're going to have a really hard time getting them to buy the product. But if they think the value is greater or maybe equal, but tends to be greater than what you're charging, it's not as difficult. So you've got to get into the mindset of the customer. And again, we're humans, we're tricky. So it is a little bit of art and science to figure out where does you know their value align to what I want to charge and how can I slice and dice features, capabilities, the model that you listed, how can I slice and dice that in a way that fits what they're, they're perceiving as the right value? We are nearing towards the end of, of our time, uh, Diana. Let me ask you one last question. If we have founders uh, listening in right now, and are they looking to make their first hire of a head of product or a VP of product or whatever, what should they be looking at during the process of hiring this person? So it's always a tricky question because Oftentimes people come in with a checklist. I want to interview people that satisfy these five criteria. And that's mm -hmm. what they're looking for. I always recommend that's a great foundation. 
but you actually want those soft skills because mm. if the person checks all the boxes and is an asshole, that's going <laughs> to disrupt so many parts of your organization. So you've got to balance the things you can check off with the person and how they come across and their desire for collaboration, their desire for learning, their motivation, that grit, all of those characteristics, you've got to suss out of them during the mm -hmm. conversation. And those are the things that I really think make someone, you know, an exceptional product manager. Well, thank, thanks a lot, Diana, for your time. Thanks a lot for listening in and see you next time. That's it for this episode of the Wise Ones podcast. We hope you've gained some valuable insights to apply into your own journey. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review and share this with your network. Stay tuned for more deep dives with the top minds and remember, stay curious and stay wise.